Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are ending the week of prayer that we had. Of course, every week is a week of prayer in the sense that we are praying constantly for you, to you, and for the, uh, your, that you would give us the strength and the motivation, the desire to share your love with others. We know, Lord, when we truly love you, nothing will be able to shut us up. No one will be able to stop us. No matter how discouraging things get, we will look for and pray for opportunities to share your love with others. Lord, this morning as we uh, should do this, read this uh, special reading from your servant, we pray, Lord, that it will touch our hearts and, and, and encourage us to know that you're coming, you're even at the door. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, uh, if you were following, I did send an email out, uh, but if, you don't, if you're not getting my emails, please let me know so we can, we can get those to you. <clears throat> there was a link for each, of, each day of the, uh, and people have been telling me they've been enjoying uh, going through the lessons every night and, uh, or, or during the day, whenever. And uh, this is the last reading, and this one here is um, from um, Signs of the Times, um, June 24th, 1889. You say, why are you wearing, reading something so old? I mean, that's all out of date. Well, as you listen to it, you'll find that it's not out of date. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists believe that Ellen G. White, who lived from 1827 to 1915, exercised the biblical gift of prophecy, had the prophetic gift, was a messenger from God. Uh, during the 70 years of her of public ministry, uh, sh uh, she exercised that gift. So this is an excerpt from something that she wrote. Wrote more books than any woman in American history, the history of the world really, and is more translated in more languages than any other writer in the world. It's interesting, you don't hear a lot about her, but what was the name of the gentleman that um, uh, was always talked about the end of the story? This is the, and, and, uh, the rest of the story. Who is that? Paul Harvey, Paul Harvey. Uh, he really loved Ellen White. He talked about her a lot and uh, encouraged people to read Ellen White's writings. Uh, if you want a, a really great book on end times, read The Great Controversy. Or you can read a little a compilation, a book called, um, called um, End Times. <laughs> end Times. Time, uh, end Times. And that's a little book. It's a book that is a gathering of all of her writings on the time of the end. Uh, say again? Last Day Events. Thank you, Bob. See? He, he reads his, his website. <laughs> uh, Last Day Events. And you could get that book right on your website, right? Oh, you can't do it? Okay. So you can, but you can go to, on the E.G. White, um, e. White app and you can read it right online. Yeah, you can read it right there. Um, but if you want to read about the life of Christ, a beautiful story, the beautiful story of Jesus and his love, read Desire of Ages. If you want to understand the plan of salvation and how to be saved and how to have a relationship with Jesus and what righteousness by faith is all about, read the little tiny book, Steps to Christ. You will be inspired. But at the, at the bottom of all of that is God's Word, the Scripture. That is the foundation. And the last words that, that Ellen White said to any two at the last general conference, she lifted up her Bible and says, I commend to you the Word of God. That is the foundation of our faith. Seventh-day Adventists don't follow Ellen White. We follow the Bible. But Ellen White is an inspiration. And God, God Jesus said, don't, uh, do not, he said, beware of what? False prophets. If he said beware of false prophets, does that not indicate that there could be true prophets? Yeah, you're looking for a false prophet. You have to test the prophet to see whether they're from the Lord. And you can test uh, Ellen White's writings according to the criteria, and you will find that she fits the criteria, but you have to taste and see the Lord is good and, and read and find out. But anyway, this is the reading. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And this is our, was our reading this morning, our scripture reading. Has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This is what grace does. Grace is an educator. Grace is a teacher. Uh, grace is an empowerer. Grace is... The Holy Spirit works through his divine grace. So carries on. In this present world, looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And uh, praise the Lord. That's what God, I, to me this is like, this summarizes the gospel and summarizes the call that God has called us to have this experience with him. It says, this scripture teaches a very different lesson from that which is presented in the words of many of our professed, those who profess to believe the gospel. We are exhorted to live soberly, righteously, and godly in heaven, right? So we're called to live soberly, righteously, and godly in heaven, but not here, because, I mean, we're just human, right? We're going to live, we're going to not live soberly, not live righteously, and not live, um, and not live godly in this present world, because we're human. We, we can't overcome. We can't live like Jesus lived. He's God. We're, you're human, right? Is that what the Bible teaches? Thank you. Who says it does? Anyone? Listen carefully. No. God is calling us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world as we look for the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And that means if he's asking us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, that means that he has to have the power for us to do it because we can't do it ourselves. Not I, but Christ who lives in me to do what? Will and do his good pleasure. We need to cooperate with God. We need to have his power, his Holy Spirit, his comforter, his empowerer. And that's what the grace gives us as you read that uh, text over and over and over again. Some have made an objection to my work, speaking about Ellen White as she writes, because I teach that it is our duty to be looking for the personal appearing in the clouds of heaven of Jesus Christ. Uh, they, they, they said, you, you, you would think that the day of the Lord is right upon us to hear Mrs. White speak in reference to the coming of Christ. She's been preaching that same subject for the last 40 years, and the Lord's not here yet. This very objection might have been brought against the words of Christ himself. He said, by the mouth of, uh, of the beloved disciple, that's John, Behold, I come quickly. And John responds, even so, come Lord Jesus. Jesus spoke these words as words of warning and encouragement to his people. And why should we not heed them ourselves? The Lord said that it is the faithful who will be found watching and waiting for him. The exact time of Christ's second coming is not revealed. Jesus said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. But he also gave signs of his coming. And he said, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. Praise the Lord. He bade them, as the signs of his coming should appear, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption Draweth nigh. Praise the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. And he's told us, and he's given us signs, and he says, look up, look up, look up. I'm coming soon. Uh, you need to have that urgency. When we forget the urgency, when we get lulled to sleep, we're in trouble. And in view of these things, the apostle wrote, ye brethren, ye brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. Since you know not the hour of Christ's coming, since we know not the hour of Christ's coming, we must live soberly and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how much iniquity? All iniquity. Praise the Lord. Aren't you looking forward to walking free of iniquity? Free of living and always feeling guilty and feeling that you're just never reaching that goal? You know what? You have to claim those promises by the Lord. Claim them day by day. Learn to walk in uh, freed from iniquity. Believe the Bible and, and purify and allow God to purify 
you. So he goes on to say, so God gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now this word peculiar is an interesting word. Um, this, uh, his people are, pres are to persevere, are to preserve their peculiar character as his representatives. And the word peculiar, uh, another word for the word peculiar is distinctive. We are to be distinctive. We are to be different. Why are we different? Because the world, the mold is being impressed upon humanity. The world's mold. You know, to look like the world, to talk like the world, to dress like the world, to, uh, to eat like the world, to eat like. But, you know, but God's called us to be heavenly, not earthly. He's called us to be heavenly. And so that, don't be embarrassed about being heavenly. Be be, be proud that, and, and, and overjoyed to be distinctive. A, a, and another word is different from the usual or the normal. Are you different from the usual and the normal? If Jesus is living in you, you're different. When a co-worker gets, uh, gets mean to you or sort of gives you a snide remark or, you know, em, em, you know, embarrasses you or does something like that, you don't retaliate. You love them. You pray for them. You encourage them. You know, you let the water blow, go off your back. You know, you don't get all, all excited about it. Uh, it also means to be special, to be pecu peculiar, a matter of peculiar interest. Pe being peculiar is being different. And to be, uh, and to be uh, it also can be to, made, to be odd and to be curious. It seems peculiar. It's like, here's an example. It seems peculiar that she would leave town without telling anyone. This is an example of, of being peculiar, to be odd, curious. But I think the best one is to be distinctive, uh, to be distinctive. God has called us to be distinctive, to be, to be peculiar, to be distinctive. Uh, out of the norm, not in the mold, letting Jesus mold our characters. You see, the whole thing happened. God created us to have a character like Jesus. But sin came in, and it, and it disrupted that image of God in us. Our character no longer was godly anymore, right? And so we find ourselves broken and ungodly. But God doesn't leave us in that condition. He saves us. He prays for, he, he, he pays for the price of, our, you know, he prays for our sins. But then he comes into us through his spirit. And now he begins to transform us and make us holy. To make us, uh, to make us uh, godly. To make us righteous. To make us pure. Because we receive his righteousness is the gift. And when, when so he that knew no sin became sin for us. That 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, I believe. Louise is not here to, to remind me. Um, but so, he, uh, so he, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So he takes our sin. The sin that if we held on to it, what would happen? If we hold on to that sin, he, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. So if we held on to that sin, we would experience eternal death. And that is something that God cannot stand the idea of us not being with him for eternity. He loves us so much. He wants to be with us so much that he cannot stand the idea. Just the thought of us not being with him for eternity breaks his heart. And so as a result of that, he was willing to pay the price, which is beyond anything you can even begin to imagine. The sin of the whole world, billions and billions of people's sin, just landing, crushing out his very life. Hard to even begin to imagine that. Lord, help my stony heart to understand and to appreciate what you've done for us. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He, for he hath made him, who's the he? He hath made him. Father. So the Father, God, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So for he made him, that's Jesus, right? For he, the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. That's why he had to die. He became sin, and that's why, the, and, the, and the penalty of sin all came down on Jesus. And that was the second death. He experienced the second death. The Bible says in, in Revelation 20 and 20, those who, um, blessed are they that come up in the first resurrection, unto them the second death will have no power. Well, Jesus bore the second death. He took the sin 
of the world on him. And, and, and Jesus is not going to burn people in hell forever, writhing around and screaming and, and tortured, torturing people for eternity. I was surprised that even um, uh, the great, the famous, um, the famous preacher, um, what's the famous preacher, Jim, uh, in the early 18, in the 1800s? Spurgeon. Spurgeon did a talk about, uh, about people writhing around in hell. And I know Whitfield did one, you know, this, that's a famous, you know, a famous one, but he, Spurgeon did too. Spurgeon has a lot of good things to say, but he had it wrong when it comes to hell and eternal burning hell. Uh, churches have used eternal burning hell to scare people into believing in God. Does God want to be, want to be worshipped out of fear? First of all, it twists the concept of God. In fact, they say that, that, um, they say that um, Darwin, who his father was, a, if I remember correctly, a, a minister, uh, his uncle had died, and Darwin, and they were all saying, well, he was such a reprobate that he's going to be burning in hell forever. And Darwin heard this as a young person, and he said, what kind of God is like that? Like, that's not fair. Why would you, you know, someone who said no to him, burn? And so, so as a result of that, he turned against God. And that could likely have led to his looking for other reasons, other ways of explaining how we came into existence. And so inspired by that twisted concept of eternal burning hell, Darwin comes up with another theory that has been embraced by the atheistic world, and that is the evolution, this theory of evolution. So, you know, so many things have come as a result of that false teaching of the immortality of the soul, that people burn in hell forever, that you would not have any idea how many people it's turned off, turned away from God, and even come up with the idea Darwin's idea of eternal, of, of, of the idea that we are created by death. You know, because in order to be, to go through the evolutionary process, it's a process of death and pain and suffering, you know, from the fittest, you know, survival of the fittest. It means so many have to die in order for one to get to the next stage. You know what I'm saying? It's an evil, purely evil satanic system of, and it's, it's godless and it's faithless. And so, at any rate, um, so, uh, so Jesus, he, for he hath made him to be sinned for us. In other words, bore that horrible sin, the penalty of death, of death, eternal death, for us. So he became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if we are in Christ, before we were in the flesh, but he says, he says, but he says very clearly, blessed are they thou, that walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if we're in Christ, walking in the spirit, there is no condemnation to them that are walk in the, in the spirit and not after the flesh. There's no condemnation, Romans chapter 8. And so Jesus says here that when we accept his gift for us, his death in place of our sins so that we're not, we don't have to die, then he gives us the righteousness of God. In Christ. So if we are in Christ, we have his righteousness. The only righteousness we will ever have, ever, 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 ever have, is Christ's righteousness. I don't care how many good works we do. If they're being done through Christ and his righteousness, they have value. They're fruit of believing in Christ and his righteousness. He knows our hearts. We talked about that last week. He knows our hearts. He knows the motive behind everything. But when we accept Christ and his righteousness in place of our sin, then he, we just grow closer to Jesus and we demonstrate our love for him through acts of righteousness. Not acts of righteousness that we've done. It's him living in us, right? Praise the Lord. We just are opening our hearts to let him come in. And that takes the pressure off of us. We're not burdened to do good. Our burden should be to spend time with Jesus and have faith in him and let him fill us with his righteousness. Wouldn't you say amen to that? Amen. That's where we need to put the focus. You know, the fight of faith is the fight. You know, that's the fight. The effort is the connecting effort. Make the effort to connect and then let Jesus' love and his righteousness, his purity, his holiness, his, his um, godliness flow into you. And then out of that, so then you're going to want to live a lifestyle that reflects Christ dwelling in you, a lifestyle. So you're going to dress not like the world. You're going to eat not like the world. You're, going to, you're not going to live like the world. 
you're going to live heavenly principles and heavenly go godly principles. That's why this whole thing on this whole week was a, is the, the title of the whole week was um, Christian Lifestyle. The, tonight, today's title is Christian Lifestyle, Living in the End Time, Christian Lifestyle and Last Day Events. So the Christian Lifestyle. So let's get on with it. Um, but this is super beautiful and super important. So there is a work for every one of them to do. The rich show, should, uh, so I'll go back. His people are to preserve their, their particular uh, or peculiar character as his representatives. See, they hated Jesus. If they hated Jesus and persecuted Jesus, would it be surprising if people hate us, if we represent Christ? Is that surprising that they may not like us either? If we follow Jesus and stand up for Jesus? Say again. It's surprising, but it's real. You would think, how could anyone hate Jesus? He came to love this world. He healed the sick. He gave life to the blind. You know, he gave hope to those that were hopeless. How could anyone hate Jesus? I mean, he was the best, the most pure, the most holy anyone had ever seen, and no one could imagine it. But those people who were the religious people hated Jesus. Why? It's amazing. Who hated him first? Satan hated him first in heaven. He went, in, he went to war against Jesus in heaven. And so it's not surprising if we follow Jesus. He, Jesus said, those that live righteously in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a guarantee. He also said that, um, that if they hate you, they're not really hating you. They're hating me because you represent me. They're hating, really hating me, Jesus said. They will they'll aim it at you. How many have lived and died for Jesus down through the time? We don't know the exact number. During the Dark Ages, they say the minimal number is 50 million people were put to death because they wouldn't go along with the church. Because the church said, you've got to do it this way. How can a Christian church kill millions of people, torture them to death? How could, it, how could that be? What a twisted concept of God. What a twisted concept of God that you think you're doing God a favor by torturing people, skinning them alive, tearing their limbs off, you know, through the rack. I mean, I've been to those torture chambers. What twisted idea. S Satan was ruling the, and inspiring those ideas. But, there, but God has, and even that church that did those kinds of crimes, his children, many wonderful children. So he's calling us to be his wonderful children who love him and follow him. So as a result, his people are to preserve their peculiar character as his representatives. There is a work for every one of them to do. That's you and me. The rich should bring their means, the honored their influence, the learned their wisdom, the poor their virtue, if they would be effective workers for God, with God. We can all make our contribution. We all have gifts and talents to be used for God's service. That's my words. Uh, there are to, they are to bring themselves into the right relationship with God. That's not me. From now on, this, this is Ellen White. Does it sound like a false prophet talking here? Does it sound like a false prophet? I mean, many people, you go on the internet, you'll find all kinds of stuff. Oh, Ellen White, she's a false prophet. Okay, listen to anything I'm saying here. Is she a false prophet? Uh, they they'll, they'll bring themselves, you see, the devil hates Ellen White. In fact, the Bible says that uh, the characteristic is um, in Revelation chapter 12, it says the dragon, which is the, the apostate, it's the devil, but it's also the apostate church, was wrath with the woman, angry with the woman. The woman is the church, the, the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The Bible says the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19.10 is the spirit of prophecy. So the the devil hates the spirit of prophecy, hates the spirit of spiritual gift, because this gift is designed to help people to live the Christian lifestyle here and be prepared for eternity. And the devil does not want one of you or me to be lost, right? Is that true? No, he wants us all. I've talked about, I said the devil does not want any of us to be saved. He wants us all to be lost. 
And so he's doing everything he can. He hates the church. He hates the people in the church. So you are loved where sin abounds, what? Grace does much more abound. So as much as you're hated by self, the devil, don't focus on that. Focus on Jesus, the one who loves you, the one who died for you. So as they bring themselves into a right relationship with God, they are to reflect the light of his glory that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. We read of a class who put off the, that, put off the day of the coming of Jesus, but, on, but upon such, his coming will be as a thief in the night. They are, they are suddenly overtaken with destruction. Is there any reason why we should be in that class? No, absolutely not. How many there are who are willing to be rocked to sleep in the cradle of carnal security? In other words, just living for ourselves, living for our own enjoyment. It is time for us to wake out of sleep. Says the apostle, we are not of the night or darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. First, uh, First Thessalonians 5, 4 to 8. We should be awake to discern the signs of the times and to give warning to the people. So uh, we need to be awake to the signs of the time. We need to be looking at what's going on around us and recognizing these are signs of the times of Jesus coming. And we're not to say, well, I just want to believe in the love of Jesus. I want to talk about the righteousness of Christ. And I do want to talk about Jesus and I want to talk about his righteousness. But we are also to be looking at the signs because it's in the context of these signs that we need to spread the everlasting gospel, which is Christ our righteousness in verity. So it's a, we are looking at the signs, but we're also recognizing that we are in the last moments of Earth's history and people need to wake up not just us, but others as well, and we are given the job to wake them up. There are many in the world who seek a quiet, uh, a, uh, seek to quiet the alarm of the people who say, peace, peace, when there is no peace, but we should take an opposite course from this. There are many who say to the, to the aroused people, do not disturb yourselves. Go in, in, in godliness. Go in glorifying yourselves. Go on glorifying yourselves. Go on, oh, sorry, go on in godlessness. Go on glorifying yourselves and living in pleasure. The day of the Lord is not at hand. Is that the message we should be telling people? Not at all. Did not Christ have an, uh, uh, an object in view when he said, Behold, I come quickly? Did he not see his church? Uh, would need to keep this solemn event in mind. Say, uh, shall we say with the last day scoffers, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have from the beginning of the creation. I do not mean to be with that class, Ellen White says. I mean to arouse men with the message of Christ's near coming. Those who have a knowledge of present truth are under a great responsibility before the world. They are to warn men of the coming judgments. They are to present Christ to the people. They are not to go about deploring their condition uh, talking of their, of, the, of their darkness and murmuring and complaining of the hardness of the way. They are to lift up their minds to God upon the door of their hearts. Uh, op sorry, their lift minds to God, open the door of their hearts to Jesus and let him come in and abide with them. When Jesus is coming in, to our, when Jesus comes into our hearts, what will be our priority? Our selfish lives or his priority? What's Jesus' priority? Jesus, what, say again? To save, souls. to save souls. Jesus' priority is that souls that we are, his role, he came, he came uh, not to condemn the world, but to do what? To save the world. Now, we can focus on all the bad things going on, and we can almost get in that category of condemning the world, condemning this party, that party, this politician, that politician, this, this, this. this. We spend our life condemning. But Jesus does not call us to come to condemn but he called us to come and bring hope and salvation because I don't care what party you happen to belong to and what president you might be putting your alliance with, that 
president, that party, that whatever it is, will not save us. Only Jesus will. God is in control. And when he wants one in, he, bring, he puts them in. When he wants another one, he puts them in. He has a plan, a bigger plan than we have, as much as it gets to discouraging, because I know, you know, I've got one side I'm rooting for. But you know what? I've got to get beyond the rooting of this in this earth. I've got to get my mind on heavenly things. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. We've got to put our focus on heavenly things, not get distracted on earthly things. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Set your affections on things above. Who's above? Jesus. Set your affections on things above. And, but he wants to also come down here and live in our hearts and that we might work for others and represent him. Okay. We must have Christ enthroned in the heart that the soul temple may be cleansed from every defilement. Almost all defilements cleansed from, right? No? All. Hubert, all. All, all, all. Jesus came to cleanse us from every defilement. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, that the same Jesus, every, at, this, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. The interesting thing is every knee will bow. Your knee is going to bow now to serve the living Christ and to walk with him and enjoy your ministry and your life with Christ here in preparation for eternity. Doing his work, sharing his love with others, and manifesting the spirit of Christ. Or you're going to reject that, but I can guarantee you're going to bow your knee to, to God one day because the wicked will also bow their knee. But what a tragedy to bow your knee then why not bow your knee now? Get to know Jesus and bow your knee now and serve him with all your heart and soul. Every knee will bow of, uh, of things in heaven and of things in the earth and the things under the earth. And every tongue will confess, every tongue, all the atheists, all the people that hate God, their tongue will confess one day. They will realize that it were too late, that they were wrong in their assessment of God. And the plan of salvation, they thought that was for sissies. Oh, they're just a crutch. Religion's a crutch for them. You ever heard that before? It's just a crutch. Yeah, we need a crutch. I need a lot of crutches. I need a wheelchair. I need, I need, I need everything. You know, I need Jesus. Uh, but um, so every knee, every mouth will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, the, of God the Father. Even the very lost will ultimately say that God was right. They'll be, but tragically, because of their choice, they will not be able to spend eternity with God. But they will recognize every single one, including the devil, that he was wrong. And at one point, the, the, the wicked were going to turn on the devil and all those that deceive them. It's going to be a horrible thing. It'll be after probation's closed. It'll be just before Jesus comes. But there's going to be a turning on the, on, also on the papacy. And be a turning on the papacy, turning on all those that were de who dis did the deceiving, you know. But but it's too late. But that's so. Let us bow now, not later. Let's not be part of the second bowing. Let's be part of the first bowing. You might say. Uh, so every time, for behold, my my beloved, that ye have all always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now that sounds ominous. I've got to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. Do I have a work to do? Absolutely. I've got to work. I've got to put my focus on Jesus. I have to trust in Jesus. I have to have faith in Christ. And that's a joy when you get to know Jesus. But, this is what it, but the next verse is really good. Don't just stop there. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and do his good pleasure. So it's the so when we're working at our own salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God working in us, we're cooperating with him, we're inviting him to come in, take the throne of my heart, let him work out his, uh, my salvation. So we're cooperating with God. Does that make sense? He's the power. He's the, he's the power, and, and our hearts, are, we, we, are, we choose our will, opens up our hearts to him, but he's the one that does the work. We cooperate with him. You know, he's the power. 
When I press a foot, I mean, when you think about it, I drive my little Corolla, and when I press my, the gas pedal down, the car starts going. If I press it really hard, it can go really fast. And you say, wow, I've got an amazing foot. Like, this is amazing how, how, how I can make this car go just by pushing my foot down. Aren't I amazing? No, it's the engine that's doing the work. I'm just doing a little tiny bit. I'm choosing to push my foot down to get the engine to rev up and to get the thing to go. But it's the power is in the engine. Jesus is the engine. God the Father is the engine. The Holy Spirit is the engine that drives us forward in our Christian life. But we have to, but our foot is a choice. We have to choose. Choose you this day who you will serve. And every moment of the day, we keep surrendered to him. Does that make sense? So make sure that you are pressing on the foot, foot and making sure that Jesus is on the throne because when Christ is on the throne, he's the one with the power and we're the one that choose him, choose you this day who you shall serve. And so, for it's God that worketh in you to both will and do of his good pleasure. That's Philippians chapter 2, 10 to 13. The soon coming of our Savior must be a living reality to us. The question of, of all importance of this, uh, for this time is, how is it with my soul? Am I seeking to reiterate the words of Christ? Am I teaching my children uh, that they have souls to save? The peace and holiness must be part of their life. I, am I teaching them to place their hands in the hands of Jesus? Uh, that he may guide them. We have most earnest, uh, we have most earnest work to do, and we have no time to waste in drinking in the empty cisterns that can hold no water. What would that be? What, when we're talking about no time to waste drinking the empty cisterns that can hold no water, what are we talking about there? Drinking empty cisterns that hold no water. We got no time to do that. What does that mean? Fables. The fables, pardon? Time is, Time is running out, and we can't be dr drinking from falsehood. falsehood, lies about Jesus, about us and our relationship with him. We, we have to allow him to live in us, live out his life in us. The, the, with the power of Christ. So that's, so we can't, it's, it's, it's time to wake up is the message. It's time to wake up. And uh, <clears throat> we can't be drinking of the world. We can't be spending our time watching hours and hours of ridiculousness, whether it's Fox or CNN. Don't spend your time wasting your time. Spend your time with Jesus. That doesn't mean you don't know what's going on. I'm not talking about being ignorant and living on, you know, like in some kind of remote place. But but don't put your focus on the things of this world, but set your affections on things above. Get ready, because those people need Jesus, whether they're at CNN or Fox or wherever they are, uh, whatever news network or whatever they're trying to say, they need Jesus, whether that's you know, any of this, uh, your, your favorite commentators. Um, so the question of all importance for this time is, how is my soul? Am I, am I seeking to reiterate the words of Christ? Um, let's see here. We should come to Christ without delay for the water of life. We should diligently study the Bible. The study of the Bible is the greatest of greatest importance to us. The scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation, yet how few find time to search the Word of God. If you did a, even gave equal time to doing stupid things, wasting your time to studying the Bible, even equal time, that'd be better than you're doing now for many of us. I'm not talking about everyone. I'm talking maybe to myself. Men and women are all absorbed in the things of this perishing world. They are building their hopes upon worthless foundations and writing their names in the sand. Wow, there's a lot of truth to this, isn't it? It's amazing. It's amazing. You can get this online. Just, uh, I sent the links out. Uh, even those who profess to be followers of Christ do not need, do not heed his injunction. 
God gives us his rich blessings to enjoy, and he expects us to bring forth fruit to his glory, but many neglect this work. They do not make a full surrender to his will. There are many who seem to feel that uh, to think God of God and heavenly things tends to make a man gloomy and desponding. That is, dis, uh, that is detrimental to health to permit the mind to dwell upon religious subjects. When my, when my, in my youth, God opened the scriptures to my mind, giving me light upon the truths of his word, I went forth to proclaim to others the precious news of salvation. This is Ellen White when she was young, when she came to Christ, and her brother wrote to her, I beg you, do not disgrace the family. I will do anything uh, for you if you will not go on out as a preacher. Disgrace the family, I replied. Can I disgrace the family uh, for me to, pre is it, is, can it disgrace the family for me to preach Christ and him crucified? If you would give me all the gold your, in your house, or all the gold your house could hold, I would not cease giving my testimony for God. I have respect unto the recompense of the reward. I will not sleep, I will not keep silent, for when God imparts his light to me, he means that I should diffuse it to others according to my ability. Did not the priests and the rulers come to the disciples and command them to cease preaching in the name of Christ. Remember that? Yeah. Threw them in jail. Put them to death. And that's happened down to the millions of people. Millions of Christians have died because they would not shut up and, and lift up. They would not stop lifting up Christ. They shut the faithful men in prison. But the angel of the Lord came uh, to them and released them that they might speak the words of life to people. This is our work. We are to present the truths as it is in Jesus. Christ came into the world to save sinners. For 30 years, I have lived uh, our example. Uh, I've, I've endured insult, ignominy, ignominy uh, which is a deep personal humiliation and disgrace, reproach, rejection, death, yet he lives. Uh, he is a living savior. Uh, he has ascended on high to make intercession for us. Before, uh, just before his crucifixion, he prayed all his disciples might be one with him and that he, as he was one with his father. Is it indeed a possibility that sinful fallen men, men would be brought into such an exalted relationship with Christ? Such a union with Christ will bring light and peace and comfort to our souls. So read Revelation, uh, sorry, John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer for his disciples. He prayed also for us, he says, and pray for those also that believe on me through your word. That's us today. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go away, if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you, but I depart and I will send him unto you. Who would not have the comforter in times of trial? Who's the comforter? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Jesus in the presence, uh, Jesus' presence through the Holy Spirit. And um, I want to share a story with you. Uh, so to re uh, respond to the light of God and you will be like a watered garden. Your health will spring forth speedily. Your light will rise in, obs in obscurity and the glory of the Lord will be your reward. That's God's call to us today to tell the story of Christ, to talk of his power, and that you may have heaven in this world, uh, so you may have a heaven in this world to go to heaven in. Ah, okay, let me read that again. Tell of the love of Christ, talk of his power, and you may have a heaven in this world to go to heaven in. In other words, God wants us to have to be living in his heavenly presence here as we prepare to go to heaven uh, each, for eternity. Jesus said uh, that thy, my, my kingdom is not of this world. It's, it's in, within us. And so when Christ lives in us and heaven is within us, then we can really let people know what heaven will be like in heaven. 
in the heaven to come. So I wanted to read this story. And this was in the Sabbath School Quarterly. This was the story this week in the end, at the end of the Sabbath School Quarterly. And it's a beautiful story about two missionaries who greeted their supervisor, uh, Sunbei G, uh, with an excitement when, when he arrived at their jungle village in, on the Indonesian island of Papua. Uh, and they said, Pastor, we have a very nice story said Santos, a 22-year-old student missionary from the University of Klabat, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist university in the faraway Sulawesi Island. Anyone been there? No one? Okay, me neither. It's amazing how many universities and schools and, and mission stations and people are out there giving this message, the same message we give here, the Three Angels message, all over the world. This world would be lightened by his glory. It's not, you know, this is a, this is only about 22 million Adventists, but this work is more extensive than any other Protestant denomination in the world. The only, so there's always, uh, wherever you'll find an Adventist church, you're going to find a Catholic church. The two major churches of the world, one is massive with 1.2 billion people. Uh, Adventist church is only around 20, 22 billion, million, sorry. But, uh, but we have a message, and so we're everywhere. And that's, that's the beautiful thing. And we're going farther and farther all the time with Adventist World Radio, with, with satellite, with, and, and with, uh, you know, a thousand, with our prayers and with the Holy Spirit. Anyway, these missionaries, young missionaries, 22-year-old, on a year assignment on this little island. It says, we prayed for a dead eight-year-old girl, and she was resurrected. Sunbi, a South Korean missionary serving as a director of a thousand missionary movement in Indonesia, had flown in a small airplane and then walked two days and a night to reach the village in, Papa, in Papua's uh, Samut district. He had come to coach the student missionaries on the halfway point of their one-year mission service, but first he wanted to hear about the girl. You want to hear about the girl? Anyone? Okay. Uh, the student missionaries said something terrible had happened a few days before, earlier. Upon returning from a house visit, they found the villagers weeping and chanting at, uh, at the one-room hut of the village chief. The villagers were mourning for the chief's daughter, Naomi, who had died two hours earlier and, and was lying on the, on the hut floor. The witch doctor was leading the villagers in, in, in chants. The student missionaries began to weep themselves. They longed for the villagers to turn away from their dead gods and, of trees and animals and to trust in the living God of heaven. Santos and his friend sat beside Naomi's still form. Santos gently picked her up and wrapped his arms around her. And he said, Dear God, please, show a miracle to the villagers, he prayed. We have given Bible studies, and they have listened. Show them that you are a, a more powerful, that you are more powerful than trees and animals. The missionaries prayed for two hours, holding Naomi's body and crying. They sang the gospel song, Because He Lives. The villagers were touched by their tears and their prayers, and their song, and suddenly Naomi came back to life. Naomi came back to life. After two hours of prayer, two hours of tears, and two hours of, of, of faith, being, and, and, and she came back to life. And she said, Mommy, I'm hungry. You know, it's interesting. We're going to have, we're going to be hungry too at the resurrection. And what has Jesus promised? He's going to take us to heaven and we're going to have something special. A banquet. A banquet for everyone. He's going to feed us in the heavenly banquet. Do you want to be there? Amen. Amen. Me too. And it's not just wanting to be there. Are you willing to make the effort? Are you willing to make the commitment to Jesus and let him come into your heart and then let him show you how he wants you to live and read the Word, spend time with him in the Word. Uh, so at any rate, Mummy, I'm hungry. His father, the chief, was shocked. His, his own eyes, with his own eyes, he had seen something more powerful 
than the trees and the animals. The village chief gathered the villagers for Bible studies uh, with Songbi uh, the, uh, when Songbi arrived. All 57 adult villagers gave their hearts to Jesus. It was a miracle. God will do miracles when he sees fit that that's a miracle that will be for his honor and glory. It will help others to come to Jesus. He knows when he does. The person, Songbi, now is the president of the Pakistan Adventist Seminary and College. Some people might think that resurrections only occurred 2,000 years ago, but such miracles still occur today when we put our full faith in God. Amen? Thank you, God, for such a wonderful story. Thank you, Lord, what you want to do in our lives and give us faith like these young missionaries, 22 years old. Let's pray. Lord, give us that faith. Give us such a close walk with you. Let us let you fill us with your righteousness by faith. Let, you, let us, our lives be transformed so our lives are representatives of you and how you want us to look, how you want us to live, how you want us to talk, how you want us to dress, how you want us to eat, how you want us to do everything, Lord. We need you uh, to be living in our hearts and then guiding us so that we know just what to do and we know just when to do it because you are in control. Lord, you are an amazing God. You love each one of us that are here. And Lord, you long to live in our hearts and so that we can be the people that you've called us to be. And so, Lord, this morning, if it's your desire, uh, brothers and sisters, as it is mine to, to, to serve Jesus with a full and complete surrendered heart, allowing you, Lord, to be in, on the throne of our hearts, if that's your desire, put your hand up. Put one up or you can put two hands up. Whatever number of hands you have, put them up. And just let Jesus know that that's your desire and that you're willing to make the effort, as it were, uh, to organize your life in such a way that you will spend time with Jesus and uh, that, you will, uh, have, uh, that your faith might grow, because faith comes from hearing, and that we might be uh, not only ready when you come, but Lord, that we will tell others and prepare others so they'll be ready too, so that when you come, we'll have a wonderful, wonderful celebration. We'll look up and say, lo, this is our God who we waited for, and we are saved. And not just us only, but our families and our friends and all those you've given us an influence over. We thank you, Lord, for coming and putting a final end to the misery of this world. And, Lord, we can hardly wait. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.